Hello and welcome to another Outlaws of Thunder Junction limited set review. I'm Paul Chian and today we're going to be going over the green colors. Now this is the last of the set reviews as far as the monocolored cards go. The only thing remaining after this are going to be the gold cards and the colorless cards. Now before I do this set review, I do want to say if you enjoyed this content and want to support this channel in another way, I did launch my Patreon channel. The link to the Patreon is in the description below. Shout out to all the current patrons. I really do appreciate all of your support. By joining the Patreon, you do get access to a special Discord where we do spend a lot of time discussing all things limited. And right now, of course, it is very, very Outlaws of Thunder Junction limited focused. Before I head into the first card here, though, I do want to briefly talk about kind of the grading scale that I'm going to go over while I go over these cards. And it's a very simple scale. You've probably seen it in a lot of different places. It's an A through F scale. A, if a card is an A, it's a complete slam dunk first pick bomb. The, uh, drawing this card will significantly increase your win rate. Examples of cards like bombs are Aurelius Vindicator, Izoni, Cryptic Coat, and Doppelgang. Going into B, we have the good cards. If this card is in your color, you will 100% play it, and oftentimes you will be happy first picking these cards out of a pack. Examples of good cards include Neighborhood Guardian, Torch to Witness, and A Killer Among Us. Moving on, we have the C cards. These are the solid cards. And these are the cards that just are going to make up 80% uh, or 70% of the cards that you draft that end up in your deck. Uh, you Cards in this tier will almost never uh, get cut from your deck unless your deck is completely absurd. Examples of C-level cards are Bite Down on Crime, Projector Inspector, and Murder. Moving on, we have D cards. Now, D cards aren't necessarily horrible, but these are what you would classify as the filler cards of your deck. So these are the five drops that you randomly end up playing in your deck just because you need a curve topper, cards of that nature. Uh, examples of this are Suspicious Detonation, Griff Not Tracker, and Shady Informant. F tier cards. Do not ever put these cards in your deck. You will have a bad time. You will not win, win many matches. Examples of F tier cards are Magnifying Glass, Slime Against Humanity, and Behind the Mask. Now we, at this point, should become a little more familiar with, of course, the mechanics of the set. But hey, the set's not even out yet. Maybe you just stumbled upon, you just typed in Outlaws of Thunder Junction Green, and you still need to know what the mechanics do. So I'm going to quickly go over them. We have one, Saddle. Saddle is an activated ability that you can only activate as a sorcery. This comes attached to creatures. You may tap any number of untapped creatures you control other than the mount creature with saddle with total power N or more, where N is the number included in the saddle keyword. As the saddle ability, ability resolves, the mount becomes saddled until end of turn. This will likely then trigger a bonus ability once the mount has been saddled. So for example, a 2 mana 3 one with saddle, if you saddle the creature, that means you tap some other creatures, you hit the saddle number, all of a sudden you get some kind of bonus ability. Then we have plot. Plot's a new keyword where you can plot cards with plot, for example, the one like you see here. And basically what that means is you can cast this card at a later turn. You plot as a sorcery, and this, of course means that you may be able to get a discount on cards that you cast uh, later in the game. Then you have Crime. Crime is whenever you target your opponent with anything. And when, if you target your opponent, you target their creatures, their spells, or cards in their graveyard, you have committed a crime. And there are often cards in this set that benefit when you commit crimes. Then we have Spree. Spree is a new keyword that basically is tacked onto kind of modal cards. It's the new modal spell where you can pay additional costs depending on the spree card that you're casting. For example, if you have a card that's a blue casting cost and it has plus one draw a card, if you pay the one colorless extra mana, you get to draw a card. Then let's say the plus two is counter target spell. If you choose to pay two colorless mana, you can counter target spell. And if you pay two colorless and one, you can counter spell and draw a card. So there's a little bit of mixing and matching going on there with the spree. You can cast as many modes as you want on a spree card, depending on how much mana you decide to pump into that spell. So, that's the intro. Let's now head into our final monocolored set review here and start things off with Aloe Alchemist. So this is a really nice card. We have, it's one in a green for a 3-2 plant warlock. So it is an outlaw with trample. So two mana, 3-2 trample, sign me up, right? You're always playing that card. When Aloe Alchemist becomes plotted though, target creature gets plus three, plus two and gains trample until end of turn. That is a beating. And the plot cost is only one in a green. So 
If you have this in your opening hand and you just want to play this turn two, sure, by all means, two mana, three, two trampler, right? But at some point late in the game, you can just plot this and just make it so that you can push through a ton of damage with one of your other creatures, and then it comes into play later as a 3-2 Trampler. This card is incredible. It's awesome. It's going to be great in every green deck that you play. This is a very solid B here for Allo Alchemist. Moving on, we have the Ankle Biter. Green for a 1-1 Snake Death Touch. That's it. That's all you get. This card is nice. It really depends on... Let's say how many tokens can get generated in this uh, in this format to, or how many uh, incidental ways to deal one damage in the format there are. But if it's not too crazy, then this card is just fine, right? It's I think it's a C level card. You play this, and uh, most of the time you're going to be trading up on mana if you can find a way to block this against anything that your opponents can have. Better in a slightly defensively oriented deck or in a deck where you're just trying to get creatures into your graveyard. For example, the black green deck. Also works really well with fight or specifically bite spells, which I fully imagine we're gonna see once we get through all the green cards here. So C for Inkle Biter. Moving on, we have Beast Bond Outcaster. Two and a green for a 3-3 Human Druid. When Beast Bond Outcaster enters the battlefield, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, draw a card. Plot 1 in a green. So, 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three, fine card, nothing too spectacular. But if you can draw a card off of this, it's awesome, right? It's just a 3 mana, 3-3 three, three that draws you a card. But of, of course... In order to fulfill that condition, you're not going to be able to play this on turn three. It's going to be something that you play at a later point in the game once you have that four power creature in play. But look, let's say you play a three mana four two or something along those lines. Then you play this on turn four. Boom. All of a sudden on turn four, you get to play a three three and draw a card, which is a pretty solid deal. Additionally, you can just plot this on turn two, right? You just plot this on turn two, and then on turn three, you've spent two mana to get a three three. Now you can't attack with it immediately, so it's not as good as playing a two mana three three, but I'm just saying there's enough flexibility in this card where you can play a turn two, get a three three on turn three, you can play a turn three, or later you can draw it to draw, you can cast it to draw a card. So I think all those little things combined put this in the B tier. Maybe low B. Moving on, we have Betrayer at the Vault. Four and two green for an instant. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each of two other target creatures. So, this is a pretty powerful effect, right? It's six mana. If you have a big creature in play, let's say you have a four power creature in play, you get to deal four damage to two of your opponent's creatures. That's really strong. But, number one, it's really expensive. Number two, if your opponent has open mana, like, when can you cast this card? Right? Because it is an absolute disaster. If you cast Betrayal at the Vault, when your opponent has, let's say, three mana up, and you play this and they murder your creature in response, right? It is an absolute disaster. You've spent six mana and you've just gotten two for one. So, <coughs> excuse me. You need to pick your spots here. But if you can pull it off, if this card actually resolves, it is a clean two for one. So I think. There's enough downside with this card where I can't put it in the B tier. It's also expensive, but I do think it's, I do recognize that it's a powerful card, probably better in sealed deck. So probably a card that's better in uh, the pre-release. And given that, I think it balances out to something that's a C level card. I'm going to put this in my deck, but I'm certainly going to be very scared if my opponents ever have mana up when I'm trying to cast this card. Next up, we have Bristleback Sentry. One in green for a 3-3 Defender. As long as you control a creature with power 4 or greater, Bristleback Sentry, Bristle Pack Sentry can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So it looks like they're really pushing a 4 powers matter theme, which means you do need to put a little more value on 4 power creatures if you want to be green. So if, if you're playing a deck that's able to turn this on in the late game, I'm hoping that green has lots of 4 power creatures. It does. I, you don't think I'm just going in this blind, right? It does. Yeah, this should be pretty trivial to turn on. There are no shortage of ginormous green creatures that you can play all at common. So this is pretty easy to turn on. And it's just a great defensive creature early. So if you're playing kind of more of a mid-range green strategy that's looking to just stall out the early game so that you can just go ahead and just cast your dinosaurs or beasts or whatever whatever creature type they're going to be, I think this is a solid role player. So this, is, this gets a, a C for me. Not something that you're going to take highly, but look... In a deck that has a lot of four power creatures, I think this card can be good. 
Moving on, we have maybe a slightly better two drop here. Bristly Bill, Spine Sower. One and a green for a 2-2 legendary creature plant druid. Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. I mean, full stop, that is a great, great card. That's a card I'm happy playing in, in, uh, in my decks. Notably, you can also target any creature. So in a pinch, you can also commit a crime. Although you don't really want to be targeting your opponent's creatures with this. But there's more abilities to this. Three green green. Double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. That is so silly. I mean, let's say you don't even play this on turn two. Let's say you play a turn three and then you get a counter. Or you play a turn two, you get a counter. By turn five, if this has not been killed, you have now put three counters on things. And you pay five mana and you get an additional three counters. Or perhaps even more if you play other things that get counters on this. This card is awesome. It's going to be one of, if not the best two-drop creature in the entire format. Uh, I'm going to give Bristly Bill an A. Maybe it's a low A because it's not completely game-breaking. But if, there, you, if you play this on turn two, just the, 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 your win rate, the chance that you're going to win this game just, is, just goes up just incredibly, right? If you have this in your opening hand, I just think you're going to win like 65% of your games at least. Moving on. Cactarantula. Four green green for a 6-5 creature with reach. That's a plant spider. This spell costs one less to cast if you control a desert. When Cactarantula becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. So that's a really, really nice thing that I think they kind of needed to tack on because oftentimes in green, we've seen so many of these large statted creatures where they're like, you know what? Let's just add a power and toughness. You know what? Let's let's add another power and toughness. And guess what? They still just end up not being good enough, right? A six mana seven seven, just not good enough. It's just too vanilla, and it's just uh, there's so like with the removal spells being upgraded, where now the uh, unconditional removal spells have are just plentiful in every color. Those effects are just not good. Those creatures are just not good enough. You need to give something. You need to give something for your six mana cards, and this I think does enough. Because if you're playing a green deck, you're likely maybe a slower deck. It's probably not going to be hard to find a desert. If you can play this as a 5-mana 6-5 reach creature, that's obviously a very, very solid creature. Especially because with that second ability tacked onto it, when this creature dies, you draw a card, right? So you can't really go too wrong with this card. So I'm going to give this... I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a 6-drop, and it's going to be a 6-drop in a lot of games. But... It's a six drop that, hey, you can still put in your deck and there are going to be times where you can cast it for five. So I'm going to give Cactarantula like a C, maybe a C minus, something around there. You're getting a little bit more than you used to for a six mana green drop creature. Next up, we have Colossal Rattleworm. What? Oh, I, man, I feel bad for Cactarantula because like, look at this thing. Two green green for a six five worm. Colossal Rattleworm has flash as long as you control a desert. 6-5 Trample, 1 in a green. Exile Colossal Rattleworm from your graveyard. Search your library for a desert card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So that ability is not going to come up as often, but just a 4-mana 6-5 Trample is just obscene, right, in terms of stats. But if you can ever just get a, a single desert in play and ambush something, you're going to eat something. You're going to eat something, and then you just have a 6-5 that just complete, that starts chunking them. And then if somehow they kill it, you still get more value and get more. Uh, you can get a land into play from this card. This thing is an absolute house. I'm going to give Colossal Rattleworm also an A. That's two A-level green rares already, by the way. Moving on. Dance of the Tumbleweeds. One in a green for a spree spell. It is a sorcery. Plus one, search your library for a basic land card or a desert card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. It's nice that you can get deserts, right? That lets you, um, for example, if you play this on turn three, right? Dance of the tumble Tumbleweeds. It works well with the Cactarantula because then on turn uh, four, you can actually play the Cactarantula. So I think that's kind of a, a natural match. And then plus three, create an XX green elemental creature token where X is the number of lands you control. So... If you just play this on turn five, without getting a land, it's a five five. If you cast both halves of this spree, you're paying six mana for a seven seven and you get to ramp yourself. So how good is this card? Well, I think if you are actively looking for desert payoffs and deserts, then this could be a role player where then 
in that case, you can play this as kind of a low level C card. But I would say that on average, this is probably a high D. It's a filler card, right? You play this five man as a five five, but a five mana five five creature is very very different than a five mana five five token because of the existence of bounce spells that can exist in this format. So it's fine if you really need deserts, you can certainly play this. But if not, then it's not something that you're actively looking. So I'm gonna go with D here for Dance of the Tumbleweeds. Moving on, we have Drover Grizzly, two and a green for a four two bear mount. Whenever Drover Grizzly attacks while saddled. Creatures you control gain trample until end of turn. It's got a saddle cost of one. So, I mean, that whole package is overall not that impressive. It's a three mana four two. It trades with a bear. Not great, right? The only reason why you would want to play this in your deck is if you have a lot of four power stuff matters. We already saw the uncommon that lets you draw a card if you have a four power creature. And then we also, of course, saw the two mana three three that can attack if you have a four power creature. So if you have a lot of stuff that cares about four power cards, I think you can take this. I'm still not taking this card very highly. I would give this a low C, high D. If you care about the four power matters thing at all, then maybe you can kind of move it into the C tier. But I'm going to give this... I actually changed my mind. I'm going to give this a high D, low C. It belongs in that range. Moving on here, we have Free Strider Commando. Now, this is a three drop I can get behind. This card, it just has everything I want in, in kind of a flexible common, right? Because for two and a green, this is a 3-3 three, three Centaur Mercenary. Free Strider Commander enters a battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it if it wasn't cast or no mana was spent to cast it. Plot three and a green. So the the way that this card works is you can either play this as a three mana, three, three. So curve filler, right? That's great. But then you can also plot this on turn four. And then when you plot it on turn four, on turn five, you get a five, five. So it's a delayed four mana, five, five also acts as a three mana, three, three. I love that. I love the flexibility that, that you get here. It's not necessarily overpowered on either end, right? A four mana delayed 5-5 five five is not the same as a four mana 5-5, five five, but the fact that you can do that, plotting also synergizes with casting multiple spells in one turn, right? If you have things that go with that, and the fact that you can play this on turn three makes me really like this card. I would give Free Strider Commando a high C because of the flexibility of the fact that you can play this on turn three, and it also acts as a strong turn four option as well. Moving on, we have Free Strider Lookout. Two and a green for a 3-3 three, three reach creature. Solid stats. Whenever you commit a crime, look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order. Disability triggers only once each turn. Yeah, love this card. Three mana, 3-3 three, three reach creature that gets you value every time you commit a crime. That is awesome, right? This just gets you a land. The thing is, too... You can trigger this at instant speed. So let's say you pass and you have a combat trick, right? Or like a removal spell. You can end of turn, kill their creature, and also rampant growth. That's awesome. On something that already has pretty decent stats, oftentimes when you have a creature that can get you card advantage like this, it's usually not this well statted. It's like a 2-3. Like I would have expected this almost to be like a 2-3 creature. So this is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three reach creature that can rumble and get you lands every time you commit a crime. Very, very solid card. I'm going to give Free Strider Lookout a B. I like this card very much. Moving on. Full steam ahead. Three. Green, green sorcery. Until end of turn, each creature you control gets plus two, plus two, and gains trample. And this creature can't be blocked by more than one creature. So this is, I guess, kind of the hustle and bustle slash overrun, overrun style card of the format. Uh, this card's a little bit better, of course, if you can generate a lot of creatures, just because then you can put plus two, plus two uh, on more things. Hustle and Bustle ended up being pretty mediocre. This is one cheaper, so I do think it's better, but I don't know that this card is still great. I think I would still just rather play um, just tricks over this, right? I think I would much rather have Snakeskin Veil in my deck over something like this, which is a card that we're going to see later on. I think there are instances where this can be good and... Every time you cast it, you're going to win. So you're going to, it's it's going to have this unnatural weight of, um, I feel like this card is great because every time I cast it, I win. But you're not going to count the times where this is still sitting in your hand. And if it was a creature or a combat trick that you could have cast earlier in the game, maybe it would have been better. So you have to consider both sides there. So I'm going to give full steam ahead a high D 
right? If you have lots of creatures in your deck and you need a way to kind of finish them off, this is something that you can play, but I'm not looking to take this highly. It's just too expensive. Moving on, we have Giant Beaver, one of many gigantic green creatures that you can play here. Three and a green for a 4-4 Vigilance Beaver mount. That's just solid stats. Four mana for four, four vigilance. When giant beaver attacks while saddled, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature that saddled it this turn. It's got a pretty high saddle cost though of three, right? So, so that's not trivial, right? You play this turn four and if you saddle it, you're removing a, a decent sized creature out of combat to attack. You do get to put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And this does have vigilance, right? So it means that you can attack with this, put a counter on your thing and also block. But... Because of the high saddle cost, uh, it's not, like I said, it's not trivial to saddle this. It's a solid body. It is a four mana, four, four vigilance creature. It's okay. I'm going to give this card just a C. Uh, I think it's fine. There is a lot of competition, I will say. We're going to get into it. But there's a lot of competition for green things that you can play on four mana. And this is just one of them. For example, I like the, um, the three mana, three, three that plots on turn four as a five, five, much more than this because it has a little more flexibility. Whereas this is just, this is what you get for this card. It's a four mana, four, four vigilance. I think it's fine. You'll play it in most of your decks, but I'm not gonna take this over a lot of the other green commons. So I'm gonna give Giant Beaver a C. Moving on, we have Gold Rush. One in a green for an instant, for an instant. Create a treasure token. Until end of turn, up to one target creature gets plus two, plus two for each treasure you control. So. What does that mean? Well, when you cast this by itself, it is two mana, target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn, and you get a treasure. But if you have any other way to make a treasure, right? Any other way to make a treasure, then all of a sudden this is two mana for plus four, plus four um, uh, for a target creature. So I think this is just a decent combat trick. Um, if you think about it, like if you can use the tre treasure later, this almost costs you one mana, right? But of course it costs two. But what I mean is you get a rebate on it at some point later in the game. So four plus two plus two, assuming you're not great at making treasures. I think this is just a fine filler level combat trick. I would give this a C because of the upside that you can uh, get out of this. Next on we have Gold Vein Hydra. Green X. Obviously, this is going to be an XX. Vigilance, Trample, Haste, Keyword Soup. Goldvein Hydra enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. When Goldvein Hydra dies, create a number of trapped treasure tokens equal to its power. So this card is kind of interesting because generally with these X type creatures, you want to play it kind of late when you have a bunch of mana, right? But then at that point, when you play this card, let's say you play this uh, on turn six, right? And it's a five, five vigilance trample haste. Eh, that's not bad. And then it dies and you have a bunch of treasures. Will you really be able to utilize all those treasures? Now, also, these treasures come into play tapped, so you won't be able to use it to turn that this dies. Um, I think they did that as a way to obviously balance this power level because it would be kind of absurd if you play this turn six, they have to block and trade, and then all of a sudden this dies and you play another six drop. So I think that takes it back a little bit. But of course, you're still just getting a lot of stats, right? I think the turn that where you really want to start, when you where you really want to play this is at least turn five. On turn five, four, four, that's a pretty good size where you get a four, four Vigilance Trample Haste. Oftentimes you're gonna have to trade. You're, this will trade with something that your opponents have. So let's say you trade with your opponent's four, four, right? Let's say you trade with your opponent's four, four Beaver, right? And then you get four treasures and you still have stuff to do with it. That's pretty solid. The thing is though, just on pure rate on in terms of stats alone, you're always kind of down power and toughness, but I think the Vigilance Trample and Haste is meant to make up for that. So I think there's enough going on here where I'll give Goldvein Hydra an A. There's a lot of keywords here, but I don't think I can, uh, excuse me, a B, but I'm not gonna give it A level status. B here for Goldvein Hydra. Moving on, we have Hard Bristle Bandit. Is this the tunnel tipster of the set? One in a green for a 1-1 one, one plant rogue. Tap to add one man of any color. Whenever you commit a crime, untap Hard Bristle Bandit. This ability triggers only once each turn. So. I don't know how often you're going to be able to get additional mana, but anytime you do, it's pretty awesome, right? Um, like anytime you 
uh, are able to get two mana out of this in any turn. That gives you a lot of extra value. And this is different than something like the Tunnel Tipster that I mentioned because this adds one mana of any color. So if there is a world where you can draft a three color deck, this is awesome, right? Because it's a two mana card that allows you to splash in conjunction with maybe um, some rampant growths or what have you. And I think for that reason, I think this card's gonna be good. In addition, we haven't gone over all the cards just yet. There's a lot of stuff to do with your mana and particularly in green, there's a lot of really powerful options at four. So oftentimes you wanna skip from two to four, right? We already saw the Beaver, Beaver, which is a four mana, four, four vigilance creature. We saw that three mana, three, three centaur that plots for four mana and comes into play as a five, five. And there's gonna be another one that we're gonna see later that might be the best of all of them. But for that reason, I think this card is going to be premium and a highly sought after common because there's a lot of redundancy at the top end of the mana curve for green. Um, so you can just choose what big green threat you have you want. They're all good, but it's gonna be a lot harder to replace this card. So I'm gonna give this card a high C. I think this card is gonna be very, very good, uh, especially when you see all the other green cards in this set. Next up, we have another mana creature here, Intrepid Stable Master. One and a green for a 2-2 reach creature. It's a human scout. Tap, add green. Tap. Add two mana of any one color. Spend this mana only to cast mount or vehicle spells. That is incredible, right? If you can ever double spell here, let's say you play this turn two. Turn three, you play like, you tap this to play a trained Erynx, and then you play a land and play another three drop. That's awesome, right? So I think given that, given the upside of this card, and given that the floor is so high as a two mana two two with reach that adds mana, I think Intrepid Stable Master is a solid B. Moving on, we have Map the Frontier. Three and a green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to two basic land cards and or desert cards. Put them onto the battlefield, tapped, then shuffle. I remember back in my day when an effect like this would be desirable. Explosive vegetation, I'm looking at you. But this type of effect is just simply far too slow for modern magic. Uh, it's cool that this also allows you to get deserts, right? That is a, that is a nice little benefit here. So if you have a really desert-centric deck, I don't know if that exists, where you get a lot of benefits for having a bunch of deserts, maybe you can play this. But for now, I'm going to give this a D until proven otherwise. If the format ends up being extremely slow and desert control is a thing, I can see playing this card. But you don't want to spend four mana to just add mana to your battlefield. That's simply not something that you want to do. Next, we have Ornery Tumblewag. Two and a green for a 2-2 two -two Brushwag Mount. At the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. So right as you cast it, you get three power and three toughness worth of stats. When Ornery Tumblewag attacks, while saddled, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on target creature, saddle cost of two. I mean, if this card doesn't die, it's just ridiculous, right? Think about it this way. If, assume your opponent doesn't, just, okay, humor me for a second. Assuming your opponent doesn't have a removal spell, all right? You play this on turn three. At the beginning of a combat, it's a 3-3, three, three. all right? Now it's your turn. Move to combat. Put another counter on the tumble wag. Saddle it up. Attack. Target the tumble wag. It's a 6-6. Six, six. It's a three mana 6-6. Six, six. On turn four, if your opponent doesn't kill it. This is a must-kill card. You can also, if you want to play it safe, like put a plus one, plus one counter on a different creature the turn you cast it if you're afraid of a removal spell. But anyways, this card is incredible. I'm going to give Ornery Tumblewag, uh, maybe it's a low A, but it's an A. That's three A level green rares. I think green might have the most bomb rares in the format. Next up, we have Outcaster Greenblade. Two and a green for a one, two human mercenary. When Outcaster Greenblade enters the battlefield, search your library for a basic land card or a desert card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Hey, I'm just always playing that card in, your, in, in my deck, right? Skittering Surveyor, hello. But not only that, it gets a desert. So that, you know, if you get a desert, especially the, 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 the lands that actually deal damage to opponents, that allows you, that gives you a nice way to commit a crime as well, right? So then when you have that two mana one one in play, you commit a crime and then all of a sudden you get an extra mana, right? On top of that, this gets plus one, plus one for each desert you control. So if you play this, this is a three mana two three. Not to mention, it can get bigger if you have more deserts in your deck. But if you're going to, I mean, sign me up for this card any day. 
If this card ever is a 3-4, I mean, that is just bananas. Three mana, 3-4, three, get a land. That is ridiculous. Outcaster, Green Blade, easy B here for me. All right, Outcaster, Trailblazer. Two and a green for a 4-2. When Outcaster, Trailblazer enters the battlefield, add one mana of any color. Whenever another creature with power power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This card has plot 2 and a green. So this card kind of has the Garrick's Uprising effect. I believe that's the name of the card. But on a body, which is way nicer, right? Because this, um, this by itself just can hit pretty hard. Now... This is not the card that you ideally want to play on turn three, mostly because you won't really be able to take advantage of the mana that you get. This is, I think, in most instances, a card that you're going to want to plot. So let's say you plot this on turn three. Turn four, you play this for free, right? You play this for free. And then now with the land that you play, you have access to five mana. With five mana, certainly, surely, you'll be able to play a creature with power four or greater and you'll be able to draw a card. And for every creature that you play uh, in addition to that, you're going to be able to continue drawing cards. So I think that's really nice. But the actual body of this card isn't great. And of course, plotting on turn three does set you behind because your opponent, if you're on the draw, if you're on the draw and you're plotting this on turn three, your opponent can do a lot of damage to you. And that might be a little bit too much to overcome. But I do like the fact that this gives you value. This I'm not going to put at A, but I will put this at B. I think the four power, they are really trying to push the four power matters theme. And I think this is precisely the type of rare that you want for those types of decks. Next, we have Patient Naturalist. And I might have an unnatural love for this card. And I probably might value this higher than most other people. Patient Naturalist, two and a green for a two, three human scout. When Patient Naturalist enters the battlefield, mill three cards. Put a land card from among the mill cards into your hand. If you can't, create a treasured token. So you know what this card is? This card was in a set, and this was the best green common in that... Granted, green was bad in that set. I don't remember the set, but the card was Eccentric Farmer. It was two and a green for a two, three, exact same text. Mill three cards. If you hit a land, put it into your hand. But that did not have the fail safe. This has a built-in fail safe. That one, if you miss the land, tough beats right? Here, if you miss a land, you still get a treasure. So no matter what, you're going to get something out of the exchange. Not to mention the fact that the black-green deck is a self-mill deck, and this is the perfect card that you want for the deck. In fact, this might be the best card, or the second best green common, if you're that archetype. And I wouldn't be surprised that this, if this card continues going up the rankings, just because this card is, number one, very likely to draw you a card, very likely to get you that land, but then if you don't, you're still getting a treasure, right? This is at worst, a red cap thief, a two, two, three mana, two, three, get a treasure, which was a pretty decent card in that set. Or this is a three mana, two, three, that ETBs get you a land, right? We already talked about Outcaster Greenblade as a three mana, two, three, right? That gets you a land. This is almost the same thing. And also it could be better in a deck that's looking to mill yourself. So I think this card is fantastic. By the way, I ran the numbers. If you have 17 lands, this has an 85% chance roughly to hit a land when you play this card. So pretty, pretty high chance to hit. I love this card. I'm giving this a high C. Next up, we have Railway Brawler. Man, the beats do not stop with green. Three green green for a 5-5 five, five reach trample. What a beating, right? But wait, there's much more. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, put X plus one plus one counters on it where X is its power. This also has plot three and a green. I mean, are you kidding me? You plot this on turn four and then you get a five, five reach trampler, right? And you play this for no mana on turn five. And then you play another thing. And that thing is, if you, let's say you play a four, four, that thing's just going to be an eight, eight. So on turn five, you're just going to put 13 power onto the battlefield. This card is also in A. I mean, if you want to talk about rate monster, this is exactly it. Because this is just going to get completely out of hand. They don't even gate it to once a turn. This card is completely bonkers. Another A-level rare here for green. I mean, I, yeah, I, I just don't even understand. How can you make so many ridiculous, just beefy monsters in green here? All right, 
This is also pretty good on raid, but it just, you know, once you, you can't really follow up the brawler. But Rambling Possum, two and a green for a 3 3 possum mount. Whenever Rambling Possum attacks while saddled, it gets plus one, plus two until end of turn. Then you may return any number of creatures that saddled it this turn to their owner's hand. It's got a saddle cost of one. So this works pretty nicely if you have anything that enters a battlefield and um, produces something. Let's say you have Prickly Pear. Let's say you saddle this with Prickly Pear. Then you can pick up the Prickly Pear, play it again, and then you get a 1-1 token. So that's always nice. It's, it's a May ability, so... That's pretty cool. So it's a three mana three three with a very cheap saddle cost, and when it attacks, it attacks as a four or five. So just a very solid creature. I'm gonna give this a high C. Next we have the Raucous Entertainer, one in a green for a two two plant bard creature. One colorless tap, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control that entered the battlefield this turn. So I think you can just get a lot of value out of this, and given that this is a two drop. That can potentially that you can potentially use to add counters to a bunch of things in the late game. I think this card just gives you a lot of value. So I mean, what more can you ask for from a two mana creature? Um, so given that, I'm gonna give this card a B. I'm gonna give this card a B. I mean, imagine especially it, uh, this works really really well. We just talked about it before, but imagine a card like Prickly Pear, right? That is a card that puts two permanents onto the battlefield. So then when you play this effect, all of a sudden you get two plus one plus one counters. That's really strong. Like if you can play Prickly Pear on turn four, then activate this ability, all of a sudden you have a three, three and a two, two. That's pretty strong. So I'm going to give this a B. It could be a low B somewhere around that tier, but something that you're always going to take and always going to be playing in your green decks. Next, we have Reach for the Sky. I think a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of discussions about the power level of this card. I'm, I'm very curious what people are going to say about this. Three and a green for an enchantment aura, Flash. Enchanted creature gets plus three, plus two, and has reach. When reach for the sky is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. So, this is a combat trick, right? It's a combat trick, and it makes any creature gigantic. And it sticks forever, right? Until the creature dies. So that's nice about it. Now... It is expensive though, right? It's a four mana trick that gives plus three, plus two. So if you if if it's a situation where your opponent has a bunch of open mana and then you play this first, like if you're the first person to blink and you play this card, you can get completely blown out. It's so expensive. If you cast this and your opponent kills your creature, I mean, your win rate, it just, it just tanks, right? But if you can, if you are the aggressor and you're putting your opponent in a really tough spot where... They kind of just have to block. You go two drop, three drop, reach for the sky. That's when you can really push the tempo, right? You can really push the tempo because then all of a sudden you've cast this combat trick, you've removed their blocker, and if they do have a removal spell for your creature, you still get the card back. So I think there is enough upside here because of the... I mean, this is the most important part about this card. That last line of text. If that last line of text does, doesn't exist, this is a D-level combat trick. Be but because of the fact that this replaces itself, I think this can make a lot of decks. I think you can probably be happy enough playing at least like one copy of this card, and it won't be that bad. I'll give this card a C, maybe a low C. It's it's definitely, I think, better than a lot of people are going to give it credit for. Well, it depends on who you are. Some people are going to be like, oh, well, this card's great. It's just draw a card. And other people are going to be like, well, this is terrible because it's so expensive. I'm going to try to skirt in between. I think it's okay. I think you can play it. I'll give it a low C. Next, we have Rise of the Varmints. Three and a green for a sorcery. Create X21 green varmint creature tokens, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Plot two in a green. Is this the new spider spawning, maybe? But this card is the payoff card for the black green self mill deck. And it looks like it can be potentially pretty incredible. I don't think this is the type of card that you're going to be playing in any regular deck, right? If you're just playing like a green white creature beatdown deck, right? Like, what are you expecting out of this, right? If you can, like, in a lot of instances, if you're not milling yourself, turn four, maybe one creature's in your graveyard? So you can't even play it then. And if you make two two ones for four mana, is that good? That's not that good either. That's fine, right? You really want to be able to make at least three creatures out of this for it to really feel like a payoff card. And the only way you can really pull that off is in the black-green self-mill deck. 
However, I will say in the black green self mill deck, one of Black's, ba Black's best commons is a self mill creature, and one of Green's best commons, I think, is also a self mill card. So in that strategy, I think this card has a pretty high ceiling, perhaps even a B level ceiling. But I think in most decks, this is probably something you're just not going to play. So I think in most decks, this is probably like a D level card. But in the self mill deck in particular, this is something that you're going to take highly and it's going to be awesome. And I am excited to draft around Rise of the Varmints. Next up, we have Smuggler's Surprise. Green Instant Spree. Plus two, mill four cards. You may put up to two creatures and or land cards from among the milled cards into your hand. Plus four and a green. That's really expensive, by the way. You may put up to two creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Plus one colorless. Creatures you control with power four or greater gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So first, I want to talk about the top ability. I think that's just a pretty decent ability in general. Uh, we already talked about how the black green decks look into mill itself, and your rate of hitting is going to be fairly high with this, right? It's a three, and it's also an instant. Oftentimes, that type of effect is a common. Um, excuse me, is a sorcery at common, right? Like two in a green, look at the top four, get something. And this one lets you get creatures and or land. So if you hit two creatures, I mean, it's kind of like a divination, right? Additionally, um, if you have infinite mana, you can, I guess, ambush creatures. But I do feel like that plus four in a green effect to put two creatures from your hand onto the battlefield, not going to be something that you're going to use that often. And when you do that without casting the plus two side of this, then you're just down a card on the exchange, right? Um, and in order for you to actually cast both the first two abilities on this, that's eight mana. You're just not going to get to eight mana all that often. But that last ability can also have relevance. Creatures you control with power four or greater gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Green has a ton of four power creatures. So that in of itself is a playable combat trick. I mean, suppose you have a board with like two four power creatures or three even. That's just a fine combat trick to play. In addition to the fact that you can also play this to get some value here, I think the most common thing that you're going to do here is try to cast this for four mana and get some get some value, right? You're going to get two cards out of, the, out of this deal most of the time and maybe use it as a combat trick along the way. And I think if you can find a way to leverage both of those cards... I think the Smuggler's Surprise can be like a like a C level card, maybe even a high C if you have a lot of uh, high uh, four power creatures. All right, moving on, we have one of the better combat tricks here in the format in Snakeskin Veil, Green Instant. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. It gains hexproof until end of turn. So this is just a really really great combat trick against any type of removal. It's not particularly good at helping you win combats, right? But it is an, it's an incredible removal spell against, um, ex, ex, excuse me, it's an incredible combat trick against removal spells specifically. So I would be very happy to at least have the first copy of Snakeskin Veil in my deck. Uh, not sure how many more than that I would like to play. It obviously just depends on uh, the format and just how much removal there is and how much I'm going to find a need for this. But I do like this. It's just a very cheap and efficient way to potentially blow your opponents out that's looking to spend three or four mana to try to kill your big creature. So I'm going to go C here for Snakeskin Veil. Moving on, we have Spinewood's Armadillo. Four green green for a 7-7 seven, seven reach ward three. Look, for a six mana card, that's about the type of stats that I would be looking for, right? Six mana for a seven, seven reach, I like it. And the ward three, meaning that if your opponent wants to kill this, they're gonna have to spend probably just as much mana to kill this card. But there's also an extra ability here. One in a green, discard spines with armadillo, search your library for a basic land card or a desert card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle and Gain three life. So there's a lot going on with this card. Six mana for a seven, seven reach with ward three. That's a fine card for you to play as a top end card in your deck. But the fact that you could also play this in the early game to discard and go find your desert, commit your crime, find the color that you need and also gain you life. I think this card's great. I think it's fantastic. I'm going to give Spineswood Armadillo a B. Moving on, we have another card from Spinewoods. The Spinewoods Paladin, four and a green for a 5-4 Human Knight with Trample. When Spinewoods Paladin enters the battlefield, you gain three life. Plot, three and a green. 
Remember when I said there's a ton of things to do on four mana in this format in green that give you giant creatures? This is another one of them. There are so many. There's three. There's three green creatures that you can play potentially uh, at four mana. So there is a huge, huge glut there, which is why Spinewoods Paladin might be the best of them. It's a really, really great creature on rate, right? If you plot this on turn four, right? Oftentimes the downside of plotting something on turn four is that you don't have something in play, right? And your opponent hits you and you take a bunch of damage. But this helps you mitigate that because you get to gain three life when this enters the battlefield. So if you think about it in that way, you plot this on turn four, turn five, you play this, you gain the three life. So the damage that you took, the turn you plotted this, almost gets completely negated, right? And then all of a sudden you have spent four mana to get a five, four trampler. That is huge. That is absolutely huge. So I think this card is just another solid giant creature to add to the long list of solid giant creatures that you can play in this format. And I'm going to get Spinewind's Paladin a C. I think it's a high C. I think this card could potentially be better, but I think given just the redundancy in the number of expensive green, or not expensive, efficiently statted great green monsters that you can play at common at four mana. I think because there's so many, they're almost interchangeable. This might be the best version of all of them, but because they're kind of interchangeable, I don't have it higher, but I think this card is great. Next on, we have Stubborn Burrow Fiend. One in a green for a 2-2 Badger Beast Mount. When Stubborn Burrow Fiend becomes saddled for the first time each turn, mill two cards. Then the Stubborn Burrow Fiend gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatured cards in your graveyard. Saddle two. Talk about an amazing way to self-mill, right? If you're drafting the black green deck, I just feel like there's a lot of just... The, the thing is, you don't have to go out of your way. There's just a lot of good cards that you play that mill yourself. So I just... I'm really excited about how this black green self-mill deck is going to play out. But anyways, you play this on turn two. You saddle it up on turn three, then you mill yourself, and then you already then you know how big this creature is going to be, which will then help you determine whether or not you should attack with it. Uh, another thing about this card is that it's not an attack trigger, right? Again, you saddle this and you just mill yourself. So you can also just do that on your turn if you just want to find a, a way to mill yourself without actually attacking. So I think this card is quite nice. Um, I'm going to give this a high C. It's just a really, really solid two. I would not be shocked if this goes higher. This could even uh, breach low B territory. But for now, I'm going to give this a high C. But I don't know. The more I look at this, the more I just feel like maybe it just does enough where, you know what? I changed my mind. I changed my mind. You know what? I, I, and, and guess what? I can do this because it's my set review. I'm going to give this a B minus. Let's move on. Next up, we have Throw from the Saddle. One in a green, sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Put a plus one, plus one counter on it instead if it's a mount. Then it deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So this puts a little more value um, on the mounts if you have a card like this. But this is just a run-of-the-mill bite spell. And it's a very good one, right? Especially if you're white-green, because I believe that's the color combination that has the most kind of a... Um, mounts right you have a, a two mana common for example the trained erinx that you can let's say you did you do that and then you do this and you put a counter on it that's awesome if you ever put a counter on something this thing just does so much work for two mana but even if you don't buy spells have always just been really really solid i think this is likely going to be the best green common in the set so take this highly bite spells are great fight spells are not i'm glad that they've completely moved over for the most part into these bite spells high c here for throw from the saddle all right, Trash the Town, Green Instant Spree, plus two colorless, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. All right, it's an airtight alibi. Plus one, target creature gains trample until end of turn. Yeah, okay. Situationally good, but it works well with the last ability. Plus one, until end of turn, target creature gains whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw two cards. That is awesome. Right? Like, the, the combination of all of these abilities just is what makes this so awesome. Because there are going to be instances where for three mana, you win a combat and put two plus one plus one counters on your creature. That's fantastic, right? If, if your opponent just can't respond and that's what you do, you're happy with that. But let's say you have four mana, right? 
and um, your opponent just doesn't block. Then all of a sudden for four mana, you get to put two plus one plus one counters on your creature and you draw two cards. That's awesome too, right? So I think the fact that there's just a lot of flexibility here. And then of course with five mana, you can win combat, trample over for, uh, for uh, like an extra point of damage and draw two cards. I mean, don't get me started here. I think this card um, is one of those where the sum of its parts kind of puts it over the top, right? Whereas you're like green and two colorless, two plus one plus one counters. Yeah, that's that's whatever. That's like a D level card, low C. Plus one trample, yeah, low D. When it deals damage, draw two cards. Yeah, that's like a C, low C, D. But the fact that they work so well together pushes it up to a B level trick for me. Moving on, we have Tumbleweed Rising, one in a green sorcery. Create an XX green elemental creature token where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. Plot two and a green. So green, as we've seen, has no shortage of very, very beefy creatures. But in order to get maximum value out of this card, of course, you need to also play this kind of later on in the game. So it's a card that kind of sits in your hand, but it does work really, really nicely with plot. It also has plot itself. So if you can set up a scenario, let's say you plot the, the Spineswood you know, that giant moose 5-4 paladin gain life card, right? You plot that, and then you just play this, right? After you play that, and then you play another 3-drop. Then you have a 5-5 five five that you play for 2 mana. That's awesome. But the thing is, it's situational, right? There are going to be instances where you don't have the 5 power creature, and this is just sitting in your hand. So I think there, th this card is one of those high ceiling, low floor type cards where there are going to be instances where this isn't necessarily good enough, but there are going to be instances where it's great. But keep in mind... Let's say you play a 3-mana three 3-3. Three, three. I mean, you can still just play this turn 4, right? Let's say you can just play this turn 4 as a 2-mana three 3-3, three, and then you just play like this and another 2-drop on turn 4. That's also really good. So the fact that it's cheap and it's it has plot gives you a lot of flexibility in how you choose to get the value that you want out of this card. So I'll give this a C, maybe a low C because it's situational. But there are instances where, yeah, this card can just make a 5-5. Five five. Next card is Voracious Varmint. One in a green for a 2-2 two, two Vigilance. One colorless sacrifice Voracious Varmint. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. So this is specifically going to be very good against white uh, because there is the common enchantment removal uh, and there's, the, there's also an uncommon uh, enchantment based removal. So when you play against that, it's going to be good. I mean, two mana, 2-2 two, two Vigilance with a nice uh, ability tacked onto this. Voracious Varmint is just going to be a C-level creature. You're always going to play this. I don't know how many, probably as many as you get, but um, something that you're happy taking in your decks. But uh, I still have it below a lot of the other green cards that I saw, but I think green just seems to be really deep. All the big cards are good. Like I just, I just feel like green is super deep. So uh, this is going to be a C-level card here for me. All right. So we are now done with the main set cards and we are now moving over to the big score cards. Let's start things off here with Ancient Cornucopia. Two and a green, artifact. Whenever you cast a spell that's one or more colors, you gain one life for each of that spell's colors. Do this only once each turn. Tap, add one mana of any color. So this is kind of your run of the mill mana lith type card. It's your three mana artifact that taps for one mana of any color. If you play a gold card, like a two color gold card, sure, you get to gain two life. Now, normally those types of cards are D level cards. I'm not the biggest fan, but this gives you a life. And this gives you a life every single turn. And I think that's not irrelevant. I think being able to gain a life every single turn, especially for a deck that's wanting to play the Ancient Cornucopia, when you're playing the Ancient Cornucopia, you're not playing it in your red-green beatdown deck, right? You're playing the Ancient Cornucopia in a deck that's looking to just cast a bunch of large spiders and large expensive creatures. And in those decks, I think the life gain does buy you time to get to the late game and hopefully try to overrun your overwhelm your opponents with just pure stats. So I think because of that life gain, I'll move Ancient Cornucopia up to like a C-level card that you can play because you can tap it every turn to gain a life. Next up, we have, oh, guess what? Another ridiculous green stat monster, Bristlebud Farmer. Two, green, green, five, five, trample. Yeah, that's already basically an A. When Bristlebud Farmer enters the battlefield, create two food tokens. Okay, are we done? No, of course we're not. When Bristlebud Farmer attacks, you may sacrifice a food. If you do, mill three cards. That's great. 
You may then put a permanent card from among them into your hand. What the heck? This is just so much value. It's a four mana five five trampler that makes two food. That makes two food. That's a self milling engine that also draws you a card. I mean, like, there's a word that we use when I used to be in R and D. There was a word that we use to, like, you know, when you add a toughness, remove a toughness, add a mana cost, add a keyword. It's they're they're called knobs, and you twist the knobs, right? just to get it to the right point, just to make sure that everything is balanced, right? I felt like when they made Bristle Bud Farmer, Dave was just like, you know what? Screw the knobs. I'm throwing the knobs out the window. We're just gonna crank everything over to maximum and see what happens. This is an A, maybe it's an A plus. This card is awesome. Next up, we have Omen Path Journey. By the way, is that like five or six A level green cards and they're all just ridiculous creatures i think so omen path journey three and a green enchantment when omen path journey enters the battlefield search your library for up to five land cards that have different names you better draft some deserts exile them then shuffle at the beginning of your end step choose a card at random exiled with omen path journey and put it onto the battlefield tapped this is clearly not meant for limited probably not meant for standard either this is an f do not take omen path journey Next up, we have St Sandstorm Salvager. Two and a green for a 1-1 one, one human artificer. When Sandstorm Salvager enters the battlefield, create a 3-3 three, three colorless golem artifact creature token. So for three mana, you're getting four power and four toughness worth of stats. Yep, that's happening. But two tap, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. They gain trample until end of turn on each creature token you control. So... Not only is this a 3-mana 1-1 one, one that puts a 3-3 three, three onto the battlefield, which is fantastic, by the way. This also has the ability for you to pay 2 mana to grow your golem. Not to mention, this targets any creature token. Not artifact token, any creature token. So in this format, there's a bunch of ways to make mercenary tokens, right? So you can pump those mercenary tokens in, uh, uh, as well. So this is a 3-mana creature that puts 4 power and 4 toughness onto the battlefield that also pumps your tokens... I mean, what are, we look, what are we talking about here? This is another A. Maybe it's a low A, but it's another A. It's like an A minus probably. It just puts a ton of uh, power and toughness onto the battlefield. We, we talk about how cards, we talk about how Prickly Pear is awesome and that's like kind of breaching B level territory. This is just so much better than that. And to, find, uh, to finish things off from the big score cards, we have Vaultborn Tyrant. Five green green for a six six dinosaur with trample. Okay, better give you some more value than that. When Vaultborn Tyrant or another creature with power four or greater enters a battlefield under your control, you gain three life and you draw a card. When Vaultborn Tyrant dies, if it's not a token, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's an artifact in addition to its creature types. So this is a seven mana six six trampler, enters the battlefield, you gain three life and you draw a card. That's giving me some serious Glintweaver vibes from the previous set, which was a great card. But not only that, if it dies, it comes back into play. And when it comes back into play, you gain three life and you draw another card. Now, I will preface this by saying this is a seven mana card, right? You can't play too many of those types of cards in your deck. But if I'm playing a seven drop, you better believe this is one of the cards that I want. Not to mention if you're playing... If you're playing other four power creatures, you're continuing to gain life and draw cards. This is the premier payoff for playing a deck that's wanting to play creatures with power four or greater. Vaultborn Tyrant, I'm going to give this a B plus. I'm going to give this a B plus and only because it costs seven mana. And you know what? If the format's low enough or if we re realize that the life gain is good enough here, it might, it might breach that low A territory. But I think this card is another ridiculous statted creature with... An ability that's just incredible that you always want. And, like that, that's the thing. If that last line of text didn't exist and it was a seven mana six six trampler that draws you a card and gains you three and triggers off of everything else that plays, that's probably close to a B level card. But this replaces itself. It's a penumbra tyrant. This thing is sweet, and I definitely want to open this one as well. Man, I just want to be green just so I can get all the rares. All right, bonus sheet cards. Clear shot. Two and a green, instant. 
Target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you control. So this is an instant bite, but also pumps your creature. This can just blow people uh, out uh, in combat. This use, this was, I believe, uh, in, in the first set that it came out, it was the best green on common at the time. So this card is incredible. It's great. This is just a B-level removal spell. Just because, I mean, there are instances where you can just like, the pump effect actually matters and you get to kill a thing at instant speed, it's just really, really flexible. So really, really like Clear Shot. Next up, we have Force of Vigor. Two green green for an instant. If it's not your turn, you may exile a green card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Destroy up to two target artifacts and or enchantment. So this is clearly not something that's meant to be played here um, in Limited. Maybe you can sideboard it in if your opponent somehow has like seven enchantments, but I'm going to give Force of Vigor an F. Definitely just don't need to take this card highly. Next up, we have Pest Infestation. For some reason, they're really hellbent on killing a bunch of artifacts and enchantments. Green XX Sorcery. Destroy up to X target artifacts and or enchantments. Create twice X 1-1 one, one, green and black pest creature tokens with when this creature dies, you gain one life. Now, this is a little bit different than the Force of Vigor. The reason being is this card you can actually cast with no targets. And the way that this works is you can destroy up to X target artifacts and or enchantments, but it's basically kind of like a pseudo fireball-y type card. It's kind of like a Hydra, except you get a bunch of tokens. And what that, by that, I mean, for three mana, you get to make two 1-1 one, one pests that when they die, you, get, you, lose, uh, you gain one life. That's not great, right? But you obviously have the flexibility of killing artifact. But the thing is, this scales as you get into the late game. For five mana, you get four tokens, right? We get to the point where when you have four tokens that are four 1-1s, one, one, the stats aren't great. But when you trade and um, you start gaining life, that's relevant. If you're trying to go wide, that's also relevant as well. So I think there's enough going on with Pest Infestation where uh, you can probably put this in your deck and then have it just be mostly fine. I'm not saying this is absurd. Obviously, this is nice that it's like once you get to the, the fact that this is a nice mana sink in the late game is pretty cool, but you're also going to have to want to do something with all the 1-1 one, one tokens. If you have a sacrifice deck, for example, this is something that you could want. I'm going to give Pest Infestation a C just because I just don't think there's going to be enough artifacts and enchantments in the format to hit to make this card be really great. Next up, we have Primal Command. Three green green for a sorcery. Choose two modes. Another modal spell. Target player gains seven life. Put target non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library. Target player shuffles their graveyard into their library. Search your library for a creature card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So the true way to get card advantage out of this card is by using the second and fourth mode of this card, which is putting basically a land that they have on top of their library and then searching your library for your best creature card. And um, that basically gives you a two for one. But at what cost? Well, five mana. That's a pretty big cost. But this also has the flexibility where if you feel like you're behind on board and you have an awesome creature to get, you can just choose to gain seven life, right? That gives you some flexibility there too. You can gain seven and get the best creature in your deck and put it in your hand. So this card definitely gets better the better the creatures that you have. And if you're green, you probably have a green rare to get. But at the same time, it's just kind of an expensive sorcery that doesn't really impact the board the turn that you cast it. I think it's simply just okay. I'm going to give C here for Primal Command. Next, we have Primal Might, a much better primal spell here. Sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus X plus X until end of turn. Then it fights up to one target creature you don't control. This is a sorcery though, so it's not like an instant speed thing. And it's a fight spell, but given the fact that you're giving your creature plus X plus X and a fight, I mean, this is like this weird like hybrid fireball removal spell. This card is awesome. You just put this on just... Especially if you can put this on like a trampling creature, right? Like your Spineswoods Paladin or whatever. You just turn it into like a 9-8, fight a big thing, and you still attack and get it for a bunch of damage. I mean, I think that gives this card a pretty, pretty high ceiling. You can just fireball people out. Also, you can put this on a flying creature. If you put this on an invasive creature, it also allows you to get in for a lot. So I'm going to give Primal Might a high B. I think this is quite a good card. I could be a little bit off here. I could imagine this card being even a low A, but we'll go B plus here so far for the Primal Might. All right. Final, final card here. Thornado, two and a green, instant. 
destroy target creature with flying, cycling one in a green. Not really the type of card that you want to play. I know it cycles, but this is a, a decent sideboard card. You can still main deck it if you need because of the cycling, but I'm going to give Tornado a D. And, you know, if you board it in against like a blue-white Flyers deck, sure, then it becomes like a C or a C plus level card. But there you have it, folks. That was the set review for the green cards. Man, those rares. Those rares look completely, completely ridiculous. I just, I mean, I gotta, I gotta, I'm gonna just tally this up here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think there were at least six A-level cards, which is more than you'll get from a lot of the other colors. For example, red has two. So green's bombs are completely ridiculous and their commons seem extremely deep. And speaking of commons, time to go over my top five commons for green for Outlaws at Thunder Junction. All right, starting things off here at number five. This one was kind of tough, but I'm gonna have Patient Naturalist at number five. And honestly, if the self mill deck ends up being really good, I wouldn't be shocked, shocked if this actually moves higher up in the rankings. Uh, but I'm going to have it here for now just because I feel like in maybe a more aggressively slanted deck, this isn't quite the creature that you want. So it's not great in every deck, but I think if you're the self-mill deck, this might even be the best common. Two and a green for a 2-3 ETBs, mill three cards. Like I said, you have an 80% shot to hit a land with this card, and if you'd miss, you still get a treasure. So I just really like the just kind of the complete package of things that you get out of this card. Moving on here. Some people might, this, might have this up higher. And it might deserve to be higher, but I have Spinewoods Paladin here at number four. This is just a tremendous beater, five mana, five, four, trample. The thing is, five mana, five, four, trample is fine. That's not, I mean, that's a good card. It's fine, but it's not insane, right? Like just on rate, that's okay. It does gain you three life. So that combination is nice, absolutely. And for plot, you get the life back, you get to plot this on turn four, and then you play it on turn five and you get the life back and then you have a pretty decent sized beater. But I will say, there's a lot of competition here for green. There's a lot of other four mana green cards that give you a 4-4 four, four, or a 5-5 five, five in terms of stats onto the battlefield. So I don't know how much better Spineswood Paladin is than all those other cards. And for that reason, I have it a little bit lower just because there's only so many four mana green cards that you can play in your deck, right? What are we looking at here? Like four? So as a result, because there's so many green commons that kind of look into this slot, I can't have it higher here than I would like. If this was the only card that was good that I wanted to play on four, then this would be higher up on the list. But right now I have it here at number four. Coming in at number three, and I think this is kind of interchangeable with the Spinewoods Paladin. And I could see it turn out that the Paladin ends up being better. But the reason why I have the Free Strider Commando here at number three is not because of the overall raw power level. I certainly th think the Spinewoods Paladin can be more powerful. But the fact that this gives you a little more flexibility here because it is something that you can play on three and it gives you just a nice creature that you can play on three, whereas there's a ton of things you can do on four, right? And because of that, I think because there's a little more scarcity in terms of what you can play at three, I think I like the commando here at number three over the paladin. This is a you know, totally fine thing to play turn three and then turn four, you plot this on four, turn five, you get a five, five. Now it's not a five, four trampler that gains you three, but again, this is a modal card. You can play this on turn three, whereas with the Paladin, it's not something that you can do. And I feel like when I'm going to be green, I feel I'm a little more concerned about the lower end of my mana curve instead of the top end, just because there's so many monsters at the top end. Coming in at number two, Hard Bristle Bandit. I think this card is going to be amazing. One in a green, one one. I mean, I'm a sucker for all mana creatures and this one is no exception. Two mana, tap, add one mana of any color is great. And the fact that there are gonna be instances where you can commit a crime and have this give you two mana, right? The thing is, we, we've already looked at a lot of the other cards. Committing a crime is not gonna be that difficult. So there's just gonna be a lot of instances where this card gets you two mana. And to get two mana out of your two mana creature is awesome. And the more I'm talking about this, the more I talk myself up, it's possible that this ends up actually being the best green common, but I'm gonna have it here at number two. In addition, I already talked about how many good expensive cards there are in this format. I think kind of like the point where you start just unloading all your amazing green creatures is turn four, right? You have the four mana, four, four Vigilance Beaver. You have the 
the centaur that we just showed. You have the the um, the five four trampler that gains you three life. Guess what? All of those cards want. It wants to turn to a hard bristle bandit. So I think picking up hard bristle bandits is going to end up being way more important than picking any up any number of those other large green creatures, just because this is a far more unique effect, and this is all within the context of the format. Like if there were two two mana creatures in green, then obviously I would look at the other expensive green cards more. But that's not the case. This is the card that you're going to want more copies of than all the other expensive green cards for your deck. Coming at number one here, you know me, I'm a sucker for removal spells. I'm going to put Throw from the Saddle here at number one. It's just a solid removal spell. Bite spells have always been good. And this is a nice way to commit a crime on top of that, right? It also just goes really well with the Hard Bristle Bandit because you get an extra mana. It's a cheap spell. It's a cheap way to commit a crime. It's a great cheap removal spell. And of course, if you have a mount and you target a mount with this, it's fantastic. Like I think in green white, this is this has to go this has to be one of the best con. Like I wouldn't be shocked if this ends up being um a better card in your green white mount decks than for example even the the um two in a white um banishing light card, right? Excuse me, I can't just remember all the names offhand, but I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being better than that because this also acts as a removal spell, but at the same time, it gives you a plus one, plus one counter. And if you're in green-white, I think you're going to end up with lots of mount creatures. So throw from the saddle here at number one. Green, super deep, lots of fat creatures, lots of expensive, uh, hard-hitting creatures, a great ramp creature, a great removal spell, not to mention, honorable mention too. Uh, the card that was outside looking in, the Snakeskin Veil, another great combat trick. And honestly, because there's so many big green things to do, it's possible that card goes up a little bit in the rankings too. So I think green is looking really awesome here and it's really setting itself up to not only be a deep color, but the color that also has the most bombs. So I don't know, green might be the best, maybe second best color, we'll see, but uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. The, the the green cards all just look really, really fun. And a lot of the things that I want to do are in green. So there you have it, folks. That was the set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction Green Edition. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Feel free to hit the like or subscribe button for more daily videos just like this. If you wanted to support the content in another way and you've enjoyed what you've watched so far, I did launch a Patreon channel. We have a Discord there where we talk about all things limited, post trophy picks. Uh, I am super, super active in there. It's really your best way to, um, you know, interact with me and ask me questions about kind of what you think about the format. The link to the Patreon is in the description below. We have one color left. It's a giant beast. It's over 100 cards. The next one, the final leg of our set reviews is going to be coming out tomorrow and I will be posting my thoughts on all of the gold cards. There's a lot of sweet gold cards and the colorless cards in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. This has been amazing. I've had a blast reviewing all the cards and um, I'm really looking forward to next week when all of this comes out and we get to start battling with these cards in the pre-release, in a draft, any format available. I'm just excited. I'm done with MKM. I am ready for you, OTJ. I'll catch you tomorrow.